Okay, everyone. Um, well, welcome to, to the second day where we'll shift focus a little bit and think about um, some of the applied um, challenges when it comes to, to making a composite index of energy poverty. So um, the first kind of format will be me presenting for a bit on, on some of the methodological aspects, um, hopefully not too dry, and then I'll pass over to, to Kate to talk about kind of things that are missing in current ways of, of understanding energy poverty. So um, it was quite hard to, to kind of pitch this talk. Um, hopefully there's something here for everyone, even if you, you're completely new to, um, to making indices to statistical analysis. Um, and if you, you're already quite um, advanced in this and you've, you've made your own indices. Um, but I'd like to start really just by briefly defining what I mean by a composite index. So I've used here, um, a quote from Dobby and Dale, who um, talk about it being the combination of multiple sources of information measured in or of a system in order to provide a summary of the system that is itself not directly measurable. So as you might know, um, there exists this huge range of energy poverty indices spanning Europe, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and indeed on a, a kind of um, more comprehensive global scale, as is the case with the more recent um, paper by Che et al. Um, so these are just a few interesting examples um, and uh, shameless self-promotion in, in one part of that. Um, and I know that you know there are many more examples, uh, including from, from trainees and trainers here today, but just give you kind of an example of the variety of papers that already exist. So the supporters of, of composite indices argue um, that they're beneficial because they can summarize quite complex multidimensional information in a format that is easily understood by different stakeholders. And therefore they're quite a valuable tool, particularly for decision makers um, in trying to, to benchmark and compare countries on a certain dimension. So certainly within um, my own work with with the European Union, um, I know that they're they're very keen for trying to condense things down to as few um, indicators and kind of end results as possible. Um, moreover, people argue that it can be easier to understand a single end value than to try and interpret lots of um, different individual indicators, um, and in turn. Um, it can help to increase our engagement with the general public and, and with media um, and help spread the, the kind of dissemination of different results. But they're certainly not without controversy. Um, lots of criticisms have been levied at multi-dimensional kind of composite indices, uh, including the fact that in, in the process of building an index, it kind of necessarily involves a reduction of information, so some data flattening that I think Sid touched on in, in day one um, from a, a joint paper there. Um, it, they're typically based, um, you know, they're, they're value driven um, based on the individual assumptions of the people who construct the indexes. Um, if there are certain dimensions that are quite difficult to capture, then they may not be measured at all within an index. And this could in turn lead to some inappropriate policies being developed. And similarly, if the index is poorly constructed or the analysis of it is too simplistic, then it could also send out misleading um, policy messages. So in an ideal world, um, the construction process would look something like this. Uh, so you'd start by developing your theoretical framework and then select some variables before moving on to, to deal with things like missing data, um, you know, multivariate um, analysis, trying to normalize the data, um, and then thinking about uh, data weighting aggregation and the kind of final step of um, sensitivity analyses. So a theoretical framework um, should you know, kind of provide the basis for, for selecting and combining um, single indicators into a meaningful composite index. Um, 
which is particularly important for an, for an issue like energy poverty, which we know is, is incredibly complex, lots of different dimensions involved. But this kind of raises a lot of questions in turn of, um, do we focus our attention on the left-hand side here at some of the causes of energy poverty? So do we think about um, the energy inefficiency of a property, um, the particular characteristics of the occupants, or do we look to that right-hand side and think about outcomes, um, including poor thermal comfort, worsened health outcomes? Or indeed, do we look at a combination of both of these? And depending on the literature you might look at, um, some purists would argue you can only look at one side or the other, um, but definitely these are some key challenges that we have to, to grapple with as we try and develop that framework. However, um, whilst I kind of presented steps one and two as a, a kind of linear process, in reality, our ability to, to apply a particular framework is um, nearly always constrained by the available data that we have at you know, any given point in time, unless we are collecting our own primary data and we have a, um, you know, a large amount of resources available um, to do quite fun, new, exciting things. So um, what this means is that often actually the construction of indices is driven more by pragmatic considerations than really um, theoretical considerations. And this is a particular challenge for energy poverty as we don't have um, a dedicated survey of the problem within Europe. Moreover, um, kind of beyond constraining what variables we can choose, um, there's also problems that arise from differences in, in the meaning of a concept. So we overwhelmingly rely on secondary data collected for other purposes. Um, and we know that the, the concept that we define in our research is likely to differ from the concepts and the meaning attached to variables collected in external surveys. And so I think this is um, why it's really important to, to engage with the data documentation uh, for any kind of survey that you want to, to use, really dig deep into the the paperwork and see how was that question asked, what kind of prompts was the, uh, were the, the, um, the survey collectors using, um, just to really understand the kind of the purpose, the structure and the range of, of variables available. And even then, really, we can't truly know the meaning of a particular survey response because we simply were not there at that given moment in time. Some of the other areas of consideration, so missing data, this is nearly always a, a challenge, particularly within multi-country studies. Um, and in general, there are kind of three main responses that um, you, can, you could look into applying. Um, so the simplest method is the first one, case deletion. Um, so this involves really just omitting the missing data, the missing records from analysis. Um, and generally an accepted rule of thumb is that if a variable has more than 5% of, of missing values, then um, the cases are not deleted, you'd look for a different technique. So the other approach is really involves imputation. So um, on the one hand, as the name kind of implies, there's a single imputation, which adds a single value to each missing value point, um, whilst multiple imputation involves creating kind of multiple plausible values across different um, data sets to try and reflect the uncertainty in that process of, of estimation. Generally speaking, within European data sets, we're actually quite fortunate to have a relatively low missing data rate, particularly within, say, the EU statistics on income and living conditions, um, in part because statistical offices will have already done their own imputation methods using other kind of official data forms. Um, but there are some examples of data that's missing on a really large scale. So we'll see entire variables missing or uh, an entire country missing for a particular year. So in that kind of next stage of, of thinking about um, multivariate analysis, the reason to do this is to, to try and look at um, the overall structure of the indicators that we've selected and to try and further understand the suitability of them um, for our index. So there's a lot of different techniques that can be taken and, and I don't wanna go into detail on those today, um, but I do want to mention that 
generally speaking, there are two kind of guiding um, questions, if you will, uh, that will determine what's kind of the most appropriate set of analysis techniques. So the first one will depend on whether your overarching concept is unidimensional or as is the case for energy poverty, if it's multidimensional. Um, and secondly, what the kind of underlying um, distribution is for the concept you're exploring. So for example, it, it's debatable whether um, some of the latent traits that we, we measure in energy poverty are actually truly discrete. For example, where we have a binary indicator for um, arrears on utility bills, where it asks, have you been in, in arrears on utility bills in the last 12 months? And that's a yes, no answer. Well, we could see that actually that captures a range of different possibilities, um, kind of going from people at one end of the scale, always paying on time, not having any financial difficulties. In the middle, people who maybe sometimes have trouble budgeting, but they still do pay their, their bills on time, right through to people who um, consistently um, struggle, never pay their, their bills on time, and so they're always building up debt. So we have to really consider um, what the, the distributions are behind our, our different indicators. And then once we've, we've kind of cleared that stage, then um, there's a process of what's called normalizing the data, which is basically just to say, um, you know, the process of making your indicators comparable by changing them to, to be on the same kind of scale. So um, oftentimes this is changing <clears throat> something where there's, you know, multiple um, categories into, into a binary format. <clears throat> so weighting decisions, um, you know, after the, the actual process of choosing some indicators is definitely uh, one of the most difficult and controversial stages of the, of the process. Um, there, it, it's critically important because it can have such a profound effect on the outcome of your index and, you know, radically change the, the country ranking for, for a given um, state. But as... Um, as Nussbaumer et al, uh, who, who have created quite a widely used index for energy poverty, as they argue, um, theoretically sound frameworks to, to derive some of these rational weighting approaches are very difficult to construct. Um, and so the process of assigning weights is, is um, often arbitrary um, and incredibly value driven. So we know that this then will introduce um, lots of different biases into our index. And again, there's lots of different methods for, for trying to justify your weighting. Um, and throughout, you see a few different references there to the OECD um, handbook on, on index construction. But some interesting ones to note, um, we could try and make it data-driven by looking at factor analysis results. Um, we could do more of a top-down sort of expert weighting where a group of people come together and, and allocate different points to, to different indicators. Or we could try and do something a bit more bottom up um, and try building public opinion. So this could be through large scale public opinion polls, or it could be through um, trying to use other kind of qualitative methods like participatory workshops. And this is something we've tried to do in, um, in a case study in Mexico. Um, and it's definitely challenging, but I think it, um, I think it offers a lot of potential um, in trying to, to overcome some of those potential biases. So then having kind of done all of that, um, really the final steps involves again, evaluating what you've been doing, the decisions you've taken at various stages of that, that process. Um, and, you know, depending on the kind of indicators you have, the, the techniques will obviously vary, um, but typically involves trying to model um, what your index would look like if you change some of maybe the cutoff points, um, you change the weighting um, system around between indicators. And kind of as with um, all of the steps presented today, I definitely recommend if you're interested in, in going and viewing the OECD's handbook, um, just to get a, a much more detailed discussion of the different approaches and, and some of the arguments for and against those. So I'll, I'll wrap up um, here and just leave you with this, this quote from the OECD, who, um, who note that there's no such thing as a neutral and objective composite measure. Um, and so the issue is thus, not whether to, to make these judgments, but how to best um, make those, those choices and to make them in you know, a transparent way. 
so I think this is something I'd like us to, to kind of take forward for the rest of this session. Um, and at the end of it, the slides, you can find all of the references that I used today. So thanks very much for listening. Fab, thanks, Harriet. And um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hold on. Okay, can you all see that okay? Yeah. Okay, um, thanks very much for the talk, Harriet. Um, hi, everyone. It's lovely to virtually meet you. Um, I'm Kate Robinson and I'm a quantitative human geographer based at the University of Liverpool. The presentation I'm going to be giving today builds on the presentation by Harriet introducing composite indicators, but we're focusing on this question. So thinking about how we identify what might be missing when designing composite indicators. So given that energy poverty is such a rapidly expanding research area, um, as evidenced, I think, by everyone in the room today, both in its geographic, but also its methodological scope. I think it's really important to evaluate what we might be missing from our approaches to the measurement of energy poverty. Very briefly then, the presentation today will cover um, the following topics. Firstly, I'll talk briefly about recognition justice, which I would argue is a really useful framing for thinking about what we might be missing in terms of things like data and indicators to measure energy poverty. I'll then illustrate this by drawing on some work that was looking at the relationship between gender and energy poverty um, or energy vulnerability and designing gender sensitive indicators of energy vulnerability. The relationship between gender and energy poverty, especially in the global north, is quite an emerging research area and substantial gaps remain in data and indicators. So we'll be then thinking about evaluating what might be missing from our understanding. Firstly, though, let's start off with unpacking this concept of recognition justice or injustice. So many of you are probably familiar with this framework of energy justice. Energy justice debates tend to be structured around this kind of triad of injustices and um, distribution, recognition and procedure. And these are explored in relation to fuel poverty in England by Walker and Day, and also more widely in relation to energy justice by Jenkins et al. These concepts are really useful for challenging some of our existing um, kind of normative or stereotypical understandings of why a household or person might be experiencing energy poverty. In terms of the three concepts, um, just to run through them very briefly, distribution is this idea of who gets what. So it's quite central to a lot of um, the understandings of justice. And it's the idea of an uneven distribution of things like resources or capabilities. Procedural justice is concerned specifically with the processes that might um, produce or um, sustain um, different types of distributional injustice. So this might be that um, people haven't got um, the ability to meaningfully participate in decision making around energy, or they might not have access to information um, or legal processes to challenge decisions. Specifically, when we're thinking about um, in terms of what is missing um, in our indicators, I think recognition justice is um, a really useful concept. So recognition justice acknowledges that injustices arise from certain groups not having the respect or rights afforded to others. This means that their needs aren't recognised sufficiently. And in our case, when we're interested in energy poverty, this means a person's need for energy to ensure that they are healthy and they're well is not being sufficiently fulfilled. Recognition justice is also useful in that it seeks to account for a diverse range of outlooks. So it acknowledges um, the social, cultural, um, ethnic or racial or gender differences um, amongst others in energy use and energy poverty. We can think about recognition justice as arising either through a lack of recognition or a kind of misrecognition um, of the person. So there are five different elements on the slide um, that are mechanisms that I thought of when we were thinking about recognition injustice. They're not intended to be exhaustive, um, so they're just some of the aspects that came to mind when I was putting together the presentation, but hopefully they're a, um, a useful starting point for our discussion. 
So firstly, a uh, lack of recognition can be systematic. So essentially it's quite firmly rooted in the existing social systems that we have. This might be the result of um, structural inequalities or discrimination within society. That means that certain groups or certain issues that drive energy poverty are valued differently. Quite closely related, um, it might also be political. So we set you a reading, hopefully you saw in the list by Lucy Middlemiss that thinks about the politics of fuel poverty indicators in England. And hopefully this gives you quite a good sense of how certain groups might be prioritised for different political reasons in terms of indicators. So for example, in the context of the UK, older persons have traditionally received more universal support in terms of meeting their energy bills, which has been claimed that is partially motivated by the fact that they're the demographic that is most likely to vote. So what we might call the grey vote. Thirdly, um, there's a lack of evidence. So some aspects of vulnerability are more poorly understood because of a lack of evidence. So energy poverty is what we might think of as a relatively private or personal condition. And some of these aspects are quite tricky to measure compared to others. Closely related again, um, and touching upon some of what Harriet talked about in her presentation, there are also data limitations. So whether that be an issue of data collection, um, the resolution of the data, whether it's a case of needing to protect a person's identity or privacy concerns, this might mean we don't have the data to represent key aspects of energy poverty. And finally, um, coming back to the point I made on the previous slide, thinking about a lack of diverse outlooks. So if we don't have a diversity of voices in articulating the problem, um, for example, deciding what goes into a composite indicator, how then can we succeed in representing the issue fully? During the next part of the presentation, I want to think about applying some of these broad ideas to a specific issue and um, looking at the relationship between gender and energy vulnerability. So gender is kind of an emerging area within energy poverty research, particularly in the global north context. And until recently, energy in this context has been understood as relatively gender neutral. However, there's a lot more evidence emerging that this is not the case. However, gendered aspects of energy vulnerability are quite complex to represent um, for a number of reasons. So firstly, um, when we think about gender, we can understand it as a fundamental axis of power. So the kind of constructions of things like femininity and masculinity um, shape social relations in an uneven way. As a result, this is quite a tricky concept to represent, especially when we're thinking about using quantitative indicators. They tend to be um, quite inflexible um, and often overly simplistic, again, as Harriet alluded to. We also need um, to take an intersectional understanding that's increasingly advocated for understanding gender. Um, not just in isolation, but also as mutually constructed with different forms of social difference. So, for example, genders interrelations with um, race, ethnicity, class, disability or age. And then finally, as a geographer, of course, it's very important to re recognise that um, these issues are spatially and temporally variable um, in terms of their relationships. key issue when it comes to measuring energy poverty specifically is the role that the household plays in the condition as well and our understanding of the condition. So Gerardo Herrero recognises a fundamental assumption in energy poverty literature that takes the household rather than the individual as the key micro unit when we're carrying out an analysis. We typically then think about energy poverty as experienced by all household members uniformly. However, when we think about gender in this way, this can be particularly problematic. And it leads to what we might think of as a gender blindness, where we wrongly assume that household resources are equitably distributed between household members, when this just isn't necessarily the case. So um, that's kind of alluding to the complexity of this issue. So how then can we start to develop energy poverty or energy vulnerability indicators that are sensitive to gender and can pick up some of these um, quite complex relationships. So this is a piece of research that I carried out trying to understand just this. 
So investigating whether well understood aspects of vulnerability have a gender dimension. And in particular, I was interested in thinking about scrutinising the geographies of gendered energy vulnerabilities across England and using small area data sets available at the neighbourhood scale. The first thing I should say here is that um, what did set out to be a composite indicator and um, sort of combining indicators with the weights that um, Harriet alluded to in her presentation actually became a set of indicators as I realised that there wasn't all that much understanding about what indicators mattered um, in relation to gender. So the first step was to see whether there was data available at the neighbourhood scale um, based on an existing range of energy vulnerability indicators. I examine whether it was possible to break these down into categorically, so whether you could break them down um, by gender understood as kind of binary of male and female. You can see from the table um, that this limits our understanding um, and our indicator selection immediately. So in the column number one, you can see um, that lots of the indicators have an N next to them and they weren't, wasn't possible to represent them in this way. And this is especially the case for the infrastructural elements of energy vulnerability, so such as the inefficient properties, um, no gas central heating, the types of indicators that you might expect. We then carried out a one way ANOVA test to see whether um, women were overrepresented by the indicators. Again, this in limited our indicator selection um, losing indicators such as unemployment and elementary occupations that didn't necessarily have a gender dimension based on this understanding. And then this left us with nine indicators. And the final step was to look for spatial clusters within these indicators to try to understand the spatial distribution of um, the indicator in question. We then group the indicators into a series of common themes. Um, so the sort of five bubbles you can see on the screen, we had unpaid reproductive or caring or domestic roles, coping and helping others and um, dependence to cope, exposure or susceptibility to physiological or psychological health impacts, also a lack of social protection during the life course, and exclusion from a productive economy. And you can see in the grey the indicators that mapped onto each of these dimensions, and this was also informed by um, sort of more theoretical understanding from the literature of these relationships. To help to understand more about which women experience energy vulnerability, the spatial intersections of the high clusters of energy vulnerability according to each indicator were mapped. So high, high clusters that you can see on the screen are those that are statistically significant um, according to the indicator. Neighbourhoods that were high for all six indicators you can see highlighted there in the red. And you can see that there's quite an uneven patchwork of um, energy vulnerability across neighbourhoods in England. We have um, large urban conurbations towards the north of England um, that are formerly industrialised areas that have a high proportion of carers, ethnic minorities or other transient groups that are typically excluded from the labour market and that are typically more likely to be women. It also highlights isolated rural and coastal areas where older persons or people living alone um, are more common in terms of households. These people might lack a substantial pension but also experience negative physiological impacts of energy poverty more acutely. And then the gendered vulnerability associated with disability also intersects with both of these dimensions. So that's some initial evidence of the relationship between um, gender and energy vulnerability and thinking about how we can develop gender sensitive energy vulnerability indicators. But going forward, if we're to start to recognise gender within energy poverty indicators, what key aspects might we be missing and what are the challenges that weren't made visible within um, this analysis and other analyses to date. So firstly, um, this analysis was intercategorical. So we were necessarily adopting these binary categories of men and women, women due to the data restrictions. Although this helps to make visible the positions and outlooks of women, it obscures the the variety of gender identities that exist and that also have implications for energy use and energy needs. So that's a really key area, I think, in terms of our data collection and what we're missing. 
The analysis isn't properly intersectional, so although some of the indicators considered intersect with other forms of social difference, kind of implicitly, so for example, um, we looked at the um, intersection between gender and older age, these intersections aren't explicit, so we're not able to disaggregate individual data sets by these forms of social difference. And then some vulnerabilities are also missing as a result. So the analysis was um, okay at highlighting vulnerability due to health or economic activity, but it's a lot more challenging when it comes to things like infrastructure um, that are more closely connected to the household of the property. Some vulnerabilities are also much less amenable to quantification. So for example, things like um, supporting, other, supporting households enabling household members to cope and the emotional labour associated with energy poverty. To conclude then, um, a couple of thoughts. So it's often just as important, I think, to think about what we can't represent using indicators as what we can. This is especially true when it comes to composite indicators, when we're trying to combine multiple data sets and already potentially obscuring those individual components that we're using to make up an indicator. Gaps in our understanding can arise for a wide range of reasons, and um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge. And then finally, in-depth qualitative research can address gaps in our knowledge and underpin and inform composite indicators. And hopefully this is something that we'll touch on um, further on as the morning progresses. And I wanted to leave you with a quote from a recent paper by our organiser, Sid and colleagues, um, that recognises how any basket of indicators, or in our case, um, kind of composite indicator, risks silencing significant but hard to measure aspects or un unwarrantedly privileging others. So hopefully that sums up um, quite nicely some of the thoughts in this talk. And I will leave it there for today. Lovely. Thanks for that, Kate. Um, so we've got a little bit of time for just kind of an open discussion. Um, and then we're thinking to have just a short five minute comfort break before we get into our hands in hands on rather activity. Um, so, yeah, the floor is yours. Anyone who, who would like to ask a question. Yeah, do you want to go? Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Harriet, Caitlin, thank you for the really good presentations. Well, this is a, a really interesting uh, topic for discussion. Unfortunately, we don't have all the afternoon because that would be great. But I, I would like to kind of ask um, a few points. That's also because we work on this. It kind of uh, it's important for us and also the support for public policy as well. So touching upon maybe First, what you mentioned, Harriet, how do you see the difference between using a composite indicator that might be missing things and highlighting others, as also Caitlin was saying, then comparing to using five different indicators giving totally different messages? So for policy, and we have seen that in our discussions in the country, it seems like, uh, um, uh, well, an uh, important difference. Um, then I would like only to highlight one thing, maybe. Um, I see the use of the indexes available out there, also important to, to frame it within what's the purpose. So it's a, a comparative uh, assessment between countries. It's a comparative assessment within countries uh, or uh, like um, regions, uh, going deeper into regions, into neighborhood scale, um, trying to link it to the structural administrative components of a country or as Caitlin was showing more hotspots in different areas. So it, it, it's also a matter of how we want to use it for what? It's for public policy support, it's for, for a, a specific understanding of, as Caitlin was mentioning, so bringing specific things like gender or, or something, but all these links to public policy, regional policy is also important. That's okay for now, thank you. Should I go first, Kate? Yeah. Um, yeah, really good set of questions there. Um, as to that first one between whether to just keep the indicators separate or to, to indeed kind of combine them and, and weight them. Um, I think it's, it is really challenging. I think it does depend on 
on what level that's coming from. Um, so it's a, certainly something we grappled with. Um, so Stefan Buzrowski and I, when when we were involved with you know with setting up the European um, Commission's Energy Poverty Observatory, um, and as kind of a group, we decided that actually, given how new this topic was to um, to national level policymakers rather than researchers. Um, it was quite important to have the indicators separate um, so that it kind of forced uh, an engagement with the methodologies of each of those indicators. Whereas I think if we were making something aimed at an already informed audience, then um, a, a composite index is, um, has some advantages. Um, but I think it it is a question of your end user, like you're alluding to there in your question. Um, and how kind of literate, for want of a better word, they are with the topic and and with the methods. Um, I think something we see across the energy poverty literature, and it's certainly not unique to this topic, but um, you know there, there is often kind of a partial transfer of knowledge, and sometimes maybe um, less desirable metrics um, get kind of transferred, and there's not always that kind of critical level of engagement with um, with the methodology and, and the history behind it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it depends kind of, <laughs> kind of answer there. Um, and I, I certainly have used both approaches previously. Um, but I do think the key thing is to, to capture that multidimensionality in, in some way or another. Yeah, great set of questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to add really to what Harriet said, I guess, I think within our, well, certainly my talk, there's kind of a lot of critique of um, composite indicators but I think in some ways when we're talking about missing data it can it can also be useful for example if one indicators you know not quite up to scratch combining indicators can um sort of account for that in some ways as long as we recognize the caveats that are within it and I think it probably comes back to that final quote um on the slide that Sid's talking about the back kind of basket of indicators and having different types of indicators whether that be single indicators or composite indicators for different purposes yeah depends on the audience um i can't see any other hands up so if anybody else has a quick question and i'm not seeing you feel free to shout and jump in um otherwise oh luca Band, if there is some questions, so I can ask maybe a question that is a uh, little bit more wide. Uh, thank you for the two, the two presentations. It was extremely interesting. Uh, my, my question is um, a little bit critical, but in a good way, that I feeling that uh, that I also work on measurement and, uh, and a bit in data science, so it is it's really uh, so I feel the risk that um, uh, the current situation, for a number of reasons that you also say today or wrote, that um, we will have an, uh, a tendency in policy making to, to view energy poverty as a residual form of welfare uh, and not universalistic. So how we can combine the practice and the that today we need uh, indicators and uh, to address a targeting population in a way to precise and i believe argue that uh, not sticking to a residual form of welfare uh, which can be an issue which is this an issue in a lot of countries for other uh, form of welfare so how can balance the two Let's have the short term uh, aim and the long term uh, measure in research and in uh, dissemination activities. This is the question. Was it clear? Sorry, I think I may have switched off a little bit. Would you mind repeating the, the questions? Okay, like, sorry, I, I, I also I also yeah. very strong Italian accent. So um, no, it's so, not you. Yeah, I but, think it was me. I was kind of in a daze. <laughs> okay. So uh, these indicators can have a, a, a backfire to view energy poverty as a residual uh, form of, to have a residual form of welfare. So I'm taking the three main old uh, definition of welfare, even though 
it's they are a little bit outdated. Residual liberal and universalist. So if you stick on indicators and they are very uh, precise on social demographic and gender or disability and so forth, there is the risk to just uh, uh, targeting the most in need, the poorest of the poor. While I argue that uh, a universal welfare, uh, welfare is better. So in a way, how we balance these two objectives, if there is an objective, to have a short-term awareness of energy poverty and a targetization of issues, and a long-term universalization of this issue. And sure. this, I mean, research and discrimination. Okay, if I if I jump in first, Kate, um, so, um, I think it's a really interesting question. So my own background is social policy, public policy. So welfare state typologies is um, yeah something that we use quite a lot. Um, I, I think there's actually quite interesting differences um, in the way that it really depends on whether energy poverty is viewed as a social policy or energy policy problem. Um, so we see, for example, within Nordic countries, an interesting trend of viewing it entirely as a social policy problem. And so there's no explicit mechanisms in place. Um, and we see this especially with COVID. Um, so in a separate exercise, some colleagues from Engager have been mapping emergency responses and, and <laughs> it's completely blank up at the top in the, in the Nordic area. But that's not to say people aren't protected in other ways through kind of cash transfers, unemployment support. So it's a really interesting question. It hasn't really been, to my knowledge, kind of unpicked properly across Europe, though it would be a really interesting study to do. So maybe we should <laughs> chat later on about that. Um, but yeah, that question of universal versus residual, I think um, it's that ever present challenge. I'm sure Kate can talk more on this of viewing it as a merely an income poverty problem or actually a more structural set of issues. Um, so I'll stop talking now and <laughs> let Kate jump in. No, yeah, that's great. Thank you for the question. Um, sorry, I, I finally understand it now. <laughs> um, I think there's also um, a question, isn't there, around whether we should, with some of these indicators, especially when you're using sort of the spatially explicit indicators, you, in a way, you're advocating for targeting particular areas aren't you but actually there's an argument to be made for universal policies for example um you know policies that we have in the uk where um, we have a winter fuel payments that are paid to everybody regardless of income within a specific demographic um but there's places for um i think there's a role it, both with kind of specifically targeting areas and also these more universal policies depending on the aspect or the um the kind of dimension of energy poverty that we're trying to tackle okay brilliant well i think if that's okay with everyone um we'll take a just a five minute break so we'll come back out at 10 to um and then we'll sort of dive into a practical exercise around composite index building um so yeah see you back in in kind of four or five minutes time ready to go note about availability so Eurostat um, a few years ago went on a bit of a um, I don't know if it was cost cutting or time saving exercise but they ended up cutting quite a lot of energy poverty indicators so some of those changes we'll start to notice from this year forward um, so it's something to definitely keep in mind and then we've also I can't click on it because there's a little buzz in the way um, we've also created just um, a color coded heat map so you can quickly look and see the distribution of scores for those 10 indicators. And then there is um, this um, combined um, kind of tool where you can play around with adjusting the weight of the indicator in row three. Um, and what that will produce is um, a kind of combined score at the end here um, and an automatic chart with the results for the different countries. Um, You'll also find over here, this tells you what the kind of total weights you've used. Um, just to note, it might seem obvious, but if you assign zero to, a, to an indicator, then that won't be used. Um, if you assign 100% to more than uh, one indicator, I think that's, that's kind of fine. Um, it means that you, know, you want those 
indicators in full, um, but usually they do sort of stick to rounding up to 100%. Um, so yeah, we really just wanted to, to, to work through thinking about um, what kind of elements you think are important to include in a composite index, um, whilst reflecting on issues of availability, what kind of concept they're, they're measuring. Um, and then we can come back at the end and have a discussion about um, what's missing, touching on Kate's presentation and what we might want to do differently as a community if we had control of, of making a survey. Um, so like I said, we'll pop around and give you some individual links for this uh, and I'll hand over to Danielle to, to manage our breakout rooms. I, yeah, I'm going to ping you over to the breakout rooms now, but I've just got two more groups who I'll send the spreadsheets to. So one person from each hub will have been sent a, a separate spreadsheet link and I'll, I'll send the remaining two now. But um, yeah, I'll ping you over to the breakout rooms and we'll uh, see you back in about 30 minutes, I think, Harriet, yes? Yeah, that sounds good. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, super. So over to Stavanga to feedback. We stopped. Um, we stopped one step short of uh, nominating someone to report back. So we'll see who does it. But we made a critical decision that affected our weightage uh, deeply in the last ten seconds. So, <laughs> so I can I can start us off by saying that uh, time bound uh, targets have a big influence on the composition of a composite index. We actually joked about this be right before you all came back in the room that we should actually start by asking you all, how does the time pressure impact the work that you do? Um, so Sid, do you want to nominate somebody from your group or do you want to nominate yourself to feedback on the four questions? Maybe we can, uh, we can set the, uh, I can set the ball rolling. I can uh, pass on to Nora after that. Um, right. And I'll just, uh, I'll just respond to your point about our experience. So we spent a lot of time going back and forth on um, what things were applicable in which, which sort of certain country context and others and how to compensate for that in the balancing. And that was, uh, that was sort of a, a key criterion that informed our decision making. Yeah. Would you like me to share the screen just so we can see what weights you allocated in the end? So there we go. So anybody else from the Stavanga group want to talk maybe to, um, did you get onto some of the questions around groups that might be privileged, uh, spatial scales, thinking about how this might support policy making and or the last question around qualitative uh, data within these sets? Who's in there? Don't think we were going exactly by these questions, were we? Um, but maybe the sort of the spatial one or, or we had the, this uh, crucial change at the end um, was to do, for example, the fact that the, we're thinking whether the, the 2M and the M2 indicators, we're first thinking let's just put the primary observatory indicators really high because they must have been chosen for a reason. Um, but then we sort of went a little bit deeper in what they mean about the M2, how it, um, uh, how, you know, it can include a lot of people, for example, with uh, efficient dwellings and that will um, sort of skew, especially with, with higher income countries. And then we thought, okay, the 2M indicator is quite good, but then we realized actually when you compare different countries, it's, it's just, in some ways it's not so useful in sort of to do it in one given year because, because the 2M itself, the threshold is, can be so different um, in different countries. So, so that's why in the end, we, 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 we took them off from the, the, the highest weighted indicators. That's super. Thanks, Nora. Um, so what, what changes did you make? How were they, how were they spread prior to the last 10 seconds? Um, how were they? I mean, I think, as I said, the, M, the 2M was definitely in the highest rank of weights. And then we just, um, we decreased that. And then uh, I, so 
so the, the, the share of dwellings with leaks and dams, I guess that's um, what... It that went happened. to the thermal comfort categories. They were at 10 each and we put them up to 15 each. And, and we were, that was partly, as you're thinking, um, back and forth on whether we're capturing sort of excess energy poverty households with the share of excess winter deaths, for instance, but how to keep the weightage uh, fair for countries where it might be more significant, uh, whether it's uh, there's cooling or whether there's heating. That's great. Thanks. Harriet or Kate, do you have any questions for Stavanger? Or well, then I might uh, move to uh, Magdeburg and Dortmund group. Have we? Are you happy if I move on? Super. Um, okay, so moving next then. Uh, Harriet, are you happy to share? Are we on it already? Uh, can you see now group three? Three, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, perfect. Uh, did you nominate a speaker from your group? Dortmund, so we've got Anish, Daniel, Catherine and Luca. Uh, we did not, but if, if we can, I, I can start talking and then uh, everyone's welcome to jump in. Uh, so first to start off, the time pressure uh, affected us in a way that we didn't read the, the questions uh, correctly. So we did, uh, did our own thing. Uh, so what what we did is looked at, at the data and uh, and the index and indices uh, and uh, sort of decided that uh, each of us should would would make its own weights uh, based on on uh, the experience from uh, its own country. So we ended up uh, with uh, with several different uh, uh, sheets and uh, in the last sheet, which is named com comparison, uh, we we put all four graphs uh, side by side just to see how, how different perspectives and different weights uh, ended up modifying the, the rating and the ranking. As we were doing this, we were commenting on each of the, each of the indices uh, and uh, each of us had, had a different perspective on what's important and relevant for, uh, for each country. So we were discussing Croatia, Portugal, uh, Spain. Uh, and we ended up with relatively similar shapes, although these would need to be put side by side and, and compared into more detail to see, see the actual differences. Um, but below you can also see the, the indices that we, that we took. So I can briefly talk about Croatia. I removed the dwellings without air conditioning and uh, dwellings built before 45 because uh, data for Croatia wasn't available for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the chart in the top left. Uh, and also uh, uh, reduced the importance of the uh, indices for uh, cooling because that uh, isn't as much of a problem based on, based on my experience in, in Croatia. So uh, I, I shifted the folks, the um, the indices towards uh, winter and heating. That's great. Thanks, Luca. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really seriously impressed by how much, um, how far you've all moved it along in such a short space of time. Um, anybody else from Luca's group who wanted to add? Or uh, if I take silence, I'll, I'll move along to, to Lisbon so we can hear from the other groups. Super, then I will move to Lisbon and bear with me two seconds, Joe. Uh, I can start, but then I move to the other. So um, yeah, so we didn't were able to finish the to get to get the hundred percent of the weighting. So a lot of discussions back and forth. So we have ninety five percent. I think what what we understood really is the difficulty of of having a, this um, EU level comparisons, as Luca was also driving the discussion there. So there are a lot of different co contexts and backgrounds: summer energy poverty, the, the areas on utility bills on different perspectives, the energy efficiency of buildings. So that's a difficult part uh, we understood. Also, we we under we as by the indicators available, there was some redundancy. So we were looking for indicators that were giving the same message or fairly the same message. So to balance that, to either to exclude them or to give them a, a similar weight to avoid them being really um, getting out of, of the 
on the graph. Then we felt that other, other indicators were missing. For example, information around the, 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 the age of the building stock was provided in 1945. The number seemed to us a bit random because in different countries, the, the regulation come in 1990 or sooner or later. So putting a number here might be not the best way to do it. Maybe bringing the EPCs, the information, so the, the rating of the building stock might be relevant. Um, Maybe now I can move to, to others to comment on the other indicators or given their perspective. So other more. Yeah. yeah, the other thing that we thought was really a more of a, a consequence was of course the excess winter deaths, uh, which we lowered. And really, again, we, we discussed how it would be useful to have something with excess summer deaths, particularly with uh, climate change and how that's going to potentially affect things in the future. Um, we discussed the arrears substantially because, of course, different countries have very different ways of um, of, of actually paying these bills. And uh, so there was some debate there. Irene was talking about how in Spain it's really important. It's a really important measure. And I was saying how in Switzerland and, and in Germany um, we have this issue where uh, a lot of people who rent a property rent it balm, warm. Um, so if you rent a property, your rental will include the bills already. So you don't really have a choice to go into arrears. Um, your chances are reduced significantly, uh, and that will then skew the data, perhaps. Uh, we ended up settling on 10% anyway for that. That's brilliant. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I've recently done some field work where this was um, looking at sort of European... Uh, experiences of developing policy around rural and remote strategies for, for energy and poverty and this this came through time and time again in the rental market that they were vulnerable on uh, households in that market were vulnerable for a number of reasons but that specific element of tenancies did not exist um so yeah sort of very hidden in, in regards to that and um, that's great uh, i will move on to uh, madrid getafe madrid i think raul was in charge of the spreadsheet on this one um harriet are you okay to share group four I, I don't mind. Do you want me to show it, Raoul, or do you want to go ahead? Uh, if so, I just need to make Raoul co-host. I can show it. I can show it. Okay. Two seconds. Thanks, Raoul. Okay. Um, I can provide some thoughts, and maybe then some of my group can, can jump in up. Uh, so uh, no, the, the first comment no, uh, is that I totally not, we not totally agree with uh, your comment about uh, how difficult no, it is to define a, 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 a common index no, uh, indicator to, to measure energy poverty at the European level. Uh, because no, uh, it depends on so many uh, uh, Characteristics, you know, in each con in the country and context. So, but uh, we uh, agreed on focus how uh, this indicator, no, can influence uh, current uh, strategy um, um, uh, legislation, no, at the European level. Uh, for example, we try uh, uh, to uh, value, no, uh, uh, to value those indicators regarding uh, the quality of the, the dwelling, no? that is uh, related with the new energy efficiency strategy no? at the European level. Um, and uh, also uh, we realized uh, at, the, at the last minute no? that the, the share of uh, dwelling built before uh, 1945, no? only five countries no? have data available. So maybe uh, we... Um, uh, discussion no, about uh, provide a, a, a lower value, no? but you know, uh, is we have a, a very uh, interesting discussion. So it was quite difficult not to to provide no a, a proper uh, value no for this of the. Uh, so uh, maybe um, some of my no of, of the member of my group can can provide another thought about this analysis. Yes, yeah, and regarding the, for example, the primary indicators of the HIPO, we point out on the, um, the more the expenditure uh, ones, we um, we saw as the HEM 
overshoe indicator is actually an underconsumption indicator, it's not an energy board indicator. So we assign a, a lower weight to the move HU, but a, a higher weight to the two hand that is more an energy board indicator. So, but at the same way, we know that if we improve the M over Q, it has a possibility to have a, a, a higher weight, actually. And then on the other hand, on the more qualitative indicators, uh, we decrease and the qualitative, but also quantity indicators because we decrease the, the share of dwelling with leaks, damp, root, but it will increase the, the importance of the to keep home adequately warm because we know that the second one is directly um, related to energy poverty, and but uh, we are not sure that the first one is is actually uh, directed um, directly connected with that. And then, for example, to point out some other results, we reduced to five percent the share of excess winter death because we ne we cannot relate this excess to to energy poverty to one hundred percent. We know that. It can be because of energy poverty, but is so we decided to reduce that. As well, remember regarding the we increase the the comfort we cool in summer, but not as the same weight as the same weight of the adequately warm, because we know that in the in the future there will be an importance of cooling because of climate change. But at the same time, we know that in the present in the most of European countries. The, the the weight of heating is much more than the cooling one. That's brilliant. Thanks, Roberto. Um, all right, Kate, any questions before we move on to last group? Super. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Birmingham Group now. So group two, please, Harriet, if you could share. Um, And I can't pick on the trainers for the Birmingham Hub because they are the three of us. So if one of the trainees wouldn't mind uh, feeding back what happened in your breakout room. Uh, sure, I can say a few things. Thank you. Um, we didn't we didn't we didn't really get around to the to the question so much because we got a little bit stuck on the discussion around the indicators and selecting the right indicators, which is also inter interesting. Uh, one thing that we tried to do was to um, capture both the causes and the consequences of energy poverty. So we chose the indicators, um, indicators such as um, shared dwellings with leaks, damp and rods, inability to keep home adequately warm. Uh, but we also tried to, this capturing the consequences, we also tried to, to look at the causes mainly with um, we did the 2M and M2 indicators, which kind of capture the, the part of the income and energy costs. Uh, we tried to look for tried to look for more longitudinal data. So we excluded some indicators like uh, the share of, of, of dwellings without air conditioning, um, and also the um, because there was there was all, there was not, not so much data, and also the share of dwellings built before 1945 also not very few data data points. And another thing we 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 discussed was if we should include both summer and winter energy poverty on the same index because it could perhaps uh, flatten the analysis if a country has a, a problem in, in, in winter energy poverty and no problem in summer, maybe it could be like have a kind of a middle ground result, which would not be so good. So we kind of battle over this if we should include the, the indicators like the dwelling not comfortably cool, we ended up including it only with a small percentage. Um, and yeah, this is kind of, uh, it's I think in the end we, we may we also discussed a little bit from uh, the policy perspective like um, the outcomes of uh, the outcome of, of an index like this we, we were discussing if we should um, what what's the place or, or what outcome should we we have from these indexes like are we looking for a, an outcome that like a binary outcome that tells us uh, x percent of the population is in energy poverty and x percent is not on energy poverty or are we looking for a more of vulnerability framework type of thing, like uh, with maybe uh, an index from zero to 20 or zero to 10, which kind of gives us an idea of, of uh, lower vulnerability or higher vulnerability. But 
I mean, there's advantages for both, but uh, this list, last one, a vulnerability one, um, maybe it's hard to, to kind of draw the line also like what is, if it's, it's zero to 10, what, what does it mean to two level, level two? Is this energy poverty or no? So we kind of discussed this, we touch on this briefly, but yeah, I, I kind of, I pass the word to my colleagues <laughs> if they have something else to say. That's great, Pedro, thank you. And yeah. I think kind of a theme throughout, this has been some of the, the, the stickiness around binary when we're working in binary spaces. Yeah. I think that's sort of coming through time and again. And I really like sort of, um, much of the work around energy vulnerability from a few years back now that kind of really tries to make the case for the fluidity and the flexibility and, and how important that is. Um, I realise I've just jumped in because I got excited by that conversation. Did anybody else from the Birmingham group want to add to um, um, to the to the great discussion Pedro shared? Sid, I see your hands raised. Yeah, just to comment on uh, some things that came up uh, from the other groups that uh, that we're also really aware of in us. Um, and this idea of what scale this composite index is uh, is serving also directed a lot of our choices because uh, certainly there are things that it can't address or that are better addressed at a national or subnational scale. And so we our, our our take on that was to try to write those things out of this, not because they don't matter or they just shouldn't be captured, but maybe because they are more appropriate to capture in in sort of non-pan-European ways. Yeah, I think there's a there's a real power in sort of um, some of the conversations around recognizing the limits of this, trying not to do too much, but doing a smaller amount of, of work uh, with more strength, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, quick. May I add something from the hub? Of course, uh, yeah. We did discuss this at the really end, so it's not really sure, but I think that was the really end was time was closing that uh, not just the problem of vulnerability, so the the seriousness of energy poverty, but uh, I I believe also the discussion that we had in the Sphinx or in the other discussion that was similar that in the end there is a path dependence uh, not just in the measurement of the policy making from the fuel poverty on the winter things, not just on the measurement but also on the uh, measure to tackle that and. Uh, I believe that this is always came around when they tried to metric that's uh, this path dependence from this uh, great line of research that is impacting both summer energy poverty also like in terms of transport energy poverty and somehow needs to be either addressed or maybe made maps of metrics difference for um, regional situation. Yeah, yeah, definitely, Luca. I am. I'm conscious that we're um, uh, we're squeezing into break time, but yeah, um, do you want to just add briefly? Just two, two, two other comments. So and ideas. It's that the balance between having, for example, a, a living index, like something that it's each year at least we get some perspective of change that we can link to policies and to the measures. One thing I've noticed uh, discussing with the Portuguese authorities is this: like we cannot. Uh, subsidize or have funding for millions of euros on energy efficiency and then don't have indicators that allow to get that progress and assess that change so this is critical another thing when we're doing this uh, the difficult part of doing the CU level comparison is if we need we want to bring more indicators from different data sets for example what what was done by you was bringing the same data sets exactly for the, the country so there is a lot of gaps but maybe when we're looking to the energy efficiency of buildings, we can rely on national data sets or regional data sets, which might be different, but allows the same perspective of, of, of um, assessment of that, that condition. So this is really hard. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think anyone has a solution, but this is really interesting discussion here. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I'm actually, I'm, um, we have a bit of flexibility in the discussion after the presentation, so Nora, to keep this sort of vibrant conversation going and we'll still protect the break time but Nora did you want to come in and just add to that no then if there's it, it's a different topic kind of so it'll be fine at the end are you sure because there's with yeah yeah I mean it's just um something I yeah I realized in my head that was kind of mixing up when I was in 
imagining um, composite indicators that like now we're all looking at sort of aggregate like aggregated indicators so let's say on a sort of a country level and a regional level we look at one indicator how many people are affected is it but then well it sounds like a completely different thing to have a composite indicator on a sort of household level and if what's the name of that you know what i mean if if a household is simultaneously experiencing damp and cold and have areas then it's a it's a composite energy poverty on a household level which I think I've seen Sergio flashing some slides sometimes on, on, on this, but yeah, I think you understand my question. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. It's something I should have covered under the, the kind of aggregation part of the, the index building process. So you're absolutely right. You can, in simple terms, choose to aggregate it at the micro level. So looking at, um, you know, how many households are simultaneously you know, affected by different indicators or you can take it to the macro level, aggregate up to the regional national scale, and, and then you lose that individual data and, and the you lose a lot of range in being able to do different analyses. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. It's questions of kind of resource, um, you know, because doing that for 28 different countries would be quite resource intensive if it was like a comparative one, but you're absolutely right for um, for smaller scale studies and, and certainly um, I've built an index in the past that's done exactly that aggregated at the, the household level um, and you do get a lot more information so yeah always a tricky balance. Yeah it's almost like the intersectionality of different <laughs> yeah, aspects for something within a household. Yeah. Brilliant and I think kind of it comes back to understanding the aim, right? Or the audience or the, the reason that you're building it is kind of steering on some of those, those key decisions around where the benefits weigh out against the, the risks and the limitations. Um, super, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna draw us to a close there, even though that session was, was really sort of um, exciting and sort of thanks very much for, for all working so fast and under quite high stress and then feeding your thoughts back so clearly and calmly. Um, so uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break now and then we're going to come back to hear from the Birmingham Hub with their presentation. Um, so uh, shall we take it to 10 past and, and allow the extra couple of minutes? So if we all come back 10 past the same as Sid suggested yesterday and you did before, leave your screens on. In, I mean, you can hide your cameras and mute and disappear rather than having to rejoin. We'll see you back at 10 past for the presentation and there'll be a little bit of time at the end of that for further discussions if things pop into your head during the break. Um, but yeah, huge thank you on behalf of the Birmingham Hub trainers. See you at 10 past. Super, so uh, I hope everybody's had a, a, a decent rest in that 15 minute break there. Um, and. Um, I uh, know my brain's still sort of whirring from the, from the discussion before the break, so I'm sure we'll have some discussion after this. Um, we're now going to turn our attention to the Birmingham Hubs presentation. Um, so we're going to invite Lynn, Iona, Luca and Pedro to, uh, to give their presentation, um, uh, addressing the question around urgent thematic, urgent thematic gaps in energy poverty measurement um, and looking at some met metrics that we may or may not want to include. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Lynn. Okay, thank you for a kind introduction, Daniel. And today, uh, I'm Lynn from the SRA University of Leeds. And uh, today, uh, my dear group members and I will together bring this uh, our presentations focus on the urgent thematic gaps in energy poverty measurement and its necessary metrics in solving this. Um, so, I'm going to uh, kick off from the features of energy poverty in the EU context. All forms of energy and fuel poverty are underpinned by the common condition, the inability to attain a socially and uh, materially, uh, materially uh, necessity the level of domestic energy services. It can be affected and cause many aspects like uh, social, economic, cultural, geography difference, um, health, gender equality, education problems, etc. So, due to its uh, multi-dimensional nature, its lack of consensus on the uh, definition and uh, measurement, um, and also this uh, uh, this can be uh, defined uh, according to uh, uh, Stefan de Petro uh, and uh, Petrovas um, analyzes on the. 
different aspects on the vulnerability framework, like um, access, affordability, flexibility, energy efficiency needs and practices. Now also the governance is a uh, uh, essential role uh, in energy poverty. So not everyone exp uh, experiences it in the same way, uh, not only at national scale, uh, originally, for example, uh, in uh, developed countries, uh, uh, the poverty mainly refers to the inadequate hate in the home, uh, importance of other services, particularly space, uh, calling, hate, and appliances. Uh, however, in the uh, developing world, uh, the lack of access to adequate facilities for cooking, lighting, and um, electricity appliance, uh, but also other services such as space cooling and heating are recognized. Uh, so it's uh, culturally sensitive behind private condition, uh, also at um, household scale. Uh, people's live experience, um, habits and uh, uh, economic and social status also affect this a lot. And um, as temporally and the special dynamic uh, also be recognized in recent years and study studies, uh, but there are difficulties to track and monitor this temporally and the special evolution uh, due to the limited availability of compatible data and indicators. Uh, and finally, the uh, political will has a major role uh, in energy poverty. Uh, scholars uh, critically analyzed the um, transformation from the classic 10% to low income, high cost indicators in UK case. And uh, uh, yeah, they recognized the policy uh, to some extent, uh, emphasize on the energy efficiency as the only policy solution to energy poverty and uh, ignorance of most vulnerable groups. Um, all, all of this are argued a change in uh, definition and associated strategy targets and indicators that uh, makes a change in politics. Uh, so uh, let's turn to look for the next specific measurement. Uh, hello, Ibrahim. Thank you, Lin. Um, so there are... Um different types of energy poverty measurement in the UAE, and there was a uh, recap before, so I'll be very quick for these two slides. And there are two, basically, we identified this EU-level uh, measurement, national indicator uh, measurements, and there are mismatch between national and European surveys indicator, and the, <clears throat> the UAE favors simply uh, simple genetic indicators that allow the, uh, comparison between countries, uh, and the heap of use those and uh, using Eurostat, there are even though some uh, challenges or limitation uh, and we, that uh, they don't reflect exactly the diversity of energy poverty determinants. And there are also some uh, issues on harmonization of uh, Eurostat, especially use it data. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, some national and regional approaches are very context specific or difficult to replicate, either for the constraint of data that was mentioned before, of the different physical and methodological And um, <clears throat> there is um, a major focus on winter energy poverty and the cold countries. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why there is misrecognition or uh, not recognition of some uh, data or some issues that. So that, then there is no data that was very well explained before, political, uh, some bad deepness for research. Uh, so I don't go to explain it, to repeat, it's because there is a lack of time, but it is just the one to add this, the EU role on uh, funding research project uh, have uh, two uh, effects on having more uh, national research on uh, uh, national countries, on one end, and on the other end, there is more money, so it became a sexy topic. So there is a lot of uh, not very good research. That. Can you go? Sorry if I say that. Can you go? I'm just saying because the, it may be confusing right now. So this is the EPO indicators. The big bubbles are the the most important one. Uh, just to mention the issue of uh, modernization of EUC data, the number of room per person, which is on the top. Uh, 
right? Sorry. Uh, it really depends on the urbanization because what the rooms in a country is not a room in another country. Just uh, to make an example, can you go on the next slide, please? And there are also examples of other indicators that are national. And uh, uh, this is just an example. So the, there are some that are official, like the Leech of UK, someone that are from researcher, someone is actually written by a person that I'm looking right now, so in Portugal. Uh, there is, and there are, uh, not all of them are, uh, can be transferable. And in some cases, like an example of Italy, which is my home country, the, the building full poverty index, uh, it's limited from one region and it's constrained by the data of housing energy efficiency. And there is not, uh, there are not in all regions. So it's all every uh, European region. So it's a, uh, it's really depending on the data that are available that in that case is energy performance certificates. Uh, so I think the next is Pedro or uh, Joanna, I can remember it. the next slide. Yeah, that's me. Thank you, Luca. Mm -hmm. uh, so continuing from where uh, Luca just briefly introduced, uh, I'll start with, uh, I'll explain some of the gaps we found in energy poverty measurement in Europe. Starting from EPO, which um, the indicators are not as uniform as they appear to be, like Luca briefly explained, statistical national offices can uh, collect data in different ways. So actually what we do see in EPO may not uh, match exactly between um, and among countries. So that's a major um, gap in existing indicators. But we're also lacking more inclusive assessments like summer energy poverty and informality like the Roma population or uh, migrants. Um, we don't have many studies assessing energy poverty in extreme events such as heat waves, cold spells, or even the pandemic we're having right now. Um, most EP metrics most often miss the environmental uh, dimension of things like what's the impact on the environment. And they tend to focus on past context, providing historical depictions rather than predictions and projections into the future, like exa examining how um, energy poverty will shift uh, as climate changes, for example. Uh, there's low integration of quantitative and qualitative data and metrics, uh, for example, combining um, thermal comfort, which is uh, qualitative, and the energy inefficient and dual links people living and how those two are combined. And we also have other types of data and indicators underexplored, such as big data, citizen data, and non-energy poverty indicators, such as health metrics. And all of these gaps um, are basically a lack of detailed replicable pilot studies um, across the EU. So in many different settings that are, can help us um, fill in uh, these gaps. And the, um, uh, I'll start discussing these unexplored aspects. How do we fill these gaps? Um, starting from environmental and energy sustainability indicators, uh, there's room for um, uh, assessing emissions, air quality and quality of life, and also the likeliness of um, using renewable energy or turning to more sustainable, um, how, how policy allows uh, citizens to be more sustainable while combating energy poverty. Um, uh, we also could benefit from indoor thermal comfort and indoor air quality assessments, which are directly linked to the next point, connection to health indicators. Um, for example, respiratory diseases, mental conditions, and excess mortality rates. Um, if a household is using stoves or burning uh, biomass or wood to heat their, uh, their house, uh, it means that they likely have very high indoor pollution and therefore a range of uh, conditions um, impacting their health. And um, uh, another point uh, I think we made yesterday as well is uh, lack of energy consumption and expenditure straight from energy bills rather than model. This could be another avenue of research. And I will end with uh, political indicators such as the um, presence or absence of political actions and initiatives um, around research. And I will uh, leave you with Pedro to finish. So we also feel it would be interesting to explore the social dimension a bit further. Uh, we know that energy poverty has, has um, negative consequences on, um, on social relationships and making it more difficult to, to have a fulfilling social life, uh, causing, for instance, social isolation, um, uh, exclusion, decrease of, of working 
or school school performance, uh, productivity as well. So even though this, we know that these issues have, have many different causes, uh, it would be interesting to explore the links to, to energy poverty levels. Then uh, the citizen science, uh, there's research points to, to potential of, of citizen science and why, why uh, maybe energy poverty also could, energy poverty assessments could um, benefit from, from using this type of data. Um, mainly for this is kind of connects with the last to, the topic of last of the last day with, with the efforts to to digitalize because maybe through web apps it would be possible to collect data on on self-reported indicators that could um, provide us with the inf information important information for energy poverty assessments then um, research also points out to to kind of a, a, the an underuse of, of in infrastructure indicators in, in many energy poverty metrics, uh, especially in the, in the global north or the developed countries. And this would be indicators like um, the energy grid, uh, access to energy grid, uh, the energy supplier, type of energy supplier, type of contracts, uh, type of fuel that is being used, um, the climatization systems and so forth. Um, then, um, like uh, Johan, Johanna was saying, the big uh, other types of data, like big data, uh, we know that uh, big data like um, smart meters data, energy performance certificate raw data pertaining to buildings, uh, envelope characteristics, um, indoor conditions as well, temperature and, and um, humidity, all this kind of data is used for different assessments, for thermal comfort, for energy consumption analysis, energy consumption patterns, and it would be interesting to include this, this kind of assessments also from, a, I mean, to integrate them in the energy poverty assessments as well. Then uh, testing and conventional in indicators. We found this paper connecting energy poverty to gambling, habit, uh, ga gambling habits. And uh, it's interesting because some indicators don't seem to have any, any connection to energy poverty uh, whatsoever. But uh, uh, if we start unpacking, maybe there's, it's, there's some, links there so it will be interesting to to test some 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 of these kind of indicators and then the most energy poverty uh, studies are 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 done for the for past context maybe due to data avail availability and in i think it's imp we think it's important to to also assess energy poverty from the future perspective maybe including data from projections from climate and socioeconomic projections uh, and um try to, to get a, a prediction of how energy poverty levels will, will evolve in the future. If you can pass to the next slide, please. Yeah, then uh, moving from the, from the potential indicators more to, the, to um, a perspective of, of, uh, of broadening the scope of, of assessment, it will be important to, to more studies on, on summer energy poverty, especially considering that, um, that climate change will bring um, an increase in, in, um, in, in temperatures and all over Europe. So it becomes more important to, to assess summer energy poverty. Then also it would be important for, for indicators to have a temporal scale flexibility in order to, to be able to, to, to assess energy poverty levels, not, not, not just like in a year or um, in a year time frame, but also like accounting for or considering uh, short, short term events like uh, um, like droughts or, or like uh, heat waves, cold spells, and, and even extreme, like even um, extraordinary events like a COVID pandemic, just to assess the the, the variability of, of energy poverty levels according to this to these events. Then looking at the spatial scale, we know that um, uh, indicators can perform better at different scales, specific indicators at, at different scales. So. Uh, we, we believe that it's, we argue that it's important to, to kind of understand what indicators work best in, 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 in which scale, and also to, to kind of find a way in an algorithm of, of, of models or algorithm of, of methods to, to transversely uh, assess energy poverty from the national to household scale. And then finally, to also, we, we feel that um, uh, more focus should be, should be given to the, to the to the divides, the territorial divides, such as a rural rural urban, to unpack this kind of this kind of distinct situations of vulnerability, and also focus on on different socio uh, demographic groups, uh, unpacking the, the the situation of vulnerability 
uh, to energy poverty in, in groups like ethnic minorities, students, um, single parents, households, uh, and so forth. And this is it. Thank you. Uh, please, if you have any questions, yeah, we'll answer them. <laughs> Thank you. Lynn, if you could stop, stop sharing your screen so that we can. Yeah, I can start. Oh, there we go. Super. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I can see hands flying up and I know that Harriet's dropped a question in the um, the chat and there's some hands flying up. So I did have a question, but I'm going to hold off because I know I can email the group separately and let others dive in. We're also a bit pushed for time, but um, that was a really, really brilliant presentation. So thank you so much for the time that's gone into that, as with yesterday's. Um, yeah, really, really impressive. So thank you. Um, we'll, we'll allow five five or so minutes for questions, I think, um, following on from that. So Harriet, Kate and I, can, uh, we've talked enough so we can sort of uh, tame in our final thoughts. Um, Rodrigo, did you have your hand up initially? I was actually clapping for the presentation. Ah, <laughs> I need to put my better glasses on to be able to see the difference in hand emojis. Um, Harriet, do you want to lead in with your question or should I? No, I'm happy to step back. Um, maybe we can go to Miguel. I think he's got his hand up. Super. Thanks, Miguel. Hello, good morning. Congratulations for the presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, I have a question that how to go from these uh, indicators, indexes at uh, national, sometimes regional level to actually identify the people, to pinpoint them uh, in their cities, neighborhoods, etc and uh, to understand why they are energy poor, so what indicators relevant to them, and uh, to actually then uh, reach them and to try to, to implement uh, measures that can mitigate or alleviate energy poverty. I think you unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lynn, did you unmute when I should have unmuted? Did you want to come in and answer that question or? Miguel, maybe could you summarize again? Um, okay. Oh. It was to how to go from the indexes to mm -hmm. the people, basically. So, I can go, I can, I can, yeah. Uh, thank you, Miguel. This is a really interesting question. And actually, this is, um, uh, it's not, it's, I mean, it's not so, I would say it's not so easy to answer. Um, I think, uh, of course, indexes are, 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 are precisely made to, to, to tackle, I mean, the, the, to tackle energy poverty and to, to assess situations of vulnerability. And uh, depending on, on the different da data that is available, this can be um, easily, more easily done or, or not, so, not so easily done. Um, I feel that uh, um, from, from indicators, I think indicators can, can uh, provide you um, with, a, with kind of an overview and uh, depending on the scale that you use them. But uh, I think from indicators, it's important for, for municipalities, maybe perhaps taking the indicators going a, a bit further, maybe indicators kind of point you out to, to situations with, that you need to look at, um, certain groups or certain regions or certain situations that, that you, that kind of, uh, they highlight hotspots of, of, of a certain problem. And then I think uh, maybe authorities or, or policy designers or should go maybe even deeper and, and um, maybe connecting with people to try to understand um, it's a, maybe a door-to-door -door step to understand what really is the problem and and uh, and try to tackle to tackle the problem from there. Um, if I oh, could add uh, to that, sure, sure. Um, I think that's where the idea of pilot studies comes in because when you, I mean, all these uh, uh, unexplored aspects we've mentioned, if you take pilot studies and do work on those, then you identify the some of the how to use the data you have correctly and applicably to various settings but um, using the existing framework is really hard to 
go from the household to from the from the national to the household level. But uh, yeah, my idea is that when you do pilot studies and you take uh, regions or municipalities or whatever, then that's how you find the people and find ways to find more people. Exactly. Yeah, and it's always it's always complicated to to work at with indicators at household level, even due to data confidentiality issues. Uh, this also connects with the, the point I was bringing about the, the big data. Uh, mo it, it's, it's, it would be great to use big data sources, but of course there's uh, like the smart meters and, and energy performance certificates, but uh, there's always constraints in using data that really enables you to identify specific households. So, I mean, this is, a, this is an issue, but uh, um, it, it's possible to, to, to kind of uh, surpass it and to to counter it by 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 using the different methods and by going going yeah by, like Jonas saying pilot studies trying to understand different situations of, of, of vulnerability and, and finding kind of an analogous situations um, to to then um, uh, try to 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 develop uh, measures and, and policies to to tackle them. Super, thanks, Pedro and Iona. Um, Min, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very helpful and very um, uh, interesting idea there. So I'm, I'm interested in the indicator of unexplored aspect about mental health condition. Um, does any of the presenter of the groups have um, any more specific about um, how to measure that and which are uh, the potential indica indicator for mental health uh, as an impact of um, energy poverty? Uh, I don't know, maybe I can answer. Uh, Pedro, if it's okay for the rest of the group. And I think it's sure. connected to what Miguel was saying, uh, how the indicator can convert in something that's applicable, either a mean test at the measure or the, what maybe before was saying someone, the intervention by district. Mental health, by definition, if you want to measure it, you take an approach very positivistic. And um, so <clears throat> you can't measure, there is a lot of measurement for that. I'm not sure that can actually work for policy making. And I would doubt that uh, uh, essentially mental health is, uh, you can measure it, you can assess it in a, a, a qualitative way, depending on what, uh, what type of uh, psychological uh, strength you're looking for. I don't think uh, you can easily use it as a, for targeting uh, uh, intervention by definition because it's, uh, it's a mental health. so yeah it's actually I would say I would add that is probably is the on way around that is uh, a very often I make an example very often uh, let's say people there is a research people in Scotland in uh, social housing have mental health issue but it doesn't mean that this is the reason they they suffer from energy poverty because of mental health or vice versa is a much more complicated situation and the redu reduction is the situation is not uh, very well i mean my opinion i don't know if the other is not a very good argument for uh, the policy making yeah and i'd add to that, that actually sometimes in policy some of that can get lost that we talk about the impact of interventions as as affecting this as saving x amount of money as improving mental health and well-being and um while I understand the policy relevance of that sort of in, in shaping the impact of a particular intervention, it can get lost. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it's, uh, it's more complicated. Uh, it's, it's yeah. by definition, mental health is much more complicated than this in this, mm -hmm. I think, in this world. So you define it as risk factor from energy poverty or vice versa, it's not very helpful, in my opinion. You can find a risk factor, yeah, it, of course, because it's an epidemiological uh, as the others. Uh, but I would not uh, I translate think, um, it in means tested. That, uh... 
Yeah, agreed. And I, I oh, so, yeah, a really brief, and then I'll, I'll stop talking about it. Um, on that as well, though, I think that there's a case to be made for uh, distinguishing physical and mental health in these conversations that we're having, because uh, like we talked about with gender before, too often, actually, we talk about the health impacts and um, we know that mental health just doesn't feature in any in any way sort of as meaningfully as, as physical health does within within the discussion so I think foregrounding it has some relevance sorry Harriet did you want to add yeah just to say um so certainly within the main data sets that have been used to date um there is really no coverage of of kind of mental health proxies um but there is a really good survey the European quality of life survey um and they include quite a lot of blocks around physical and mental well-being um, so we previously used that to construct um, the World Health Organization five point index um, and that's been shown to have really good um, kind of predictability when compared against actual clinical evaluations of depression um, so, so there kind of are indices that exist but they don't feature in some of the main data sets that we pull indicators for um, so then we come back to that problem of having to only aggregate at a national level and pull in data from different surveys. Um, but yeah, definitely there needs to be so much more nuance around physical and, and mental well-being. We just don't have that right now. Thank you very much for sharing um, the resources as well. Yeah, there's a flurry yeah. coming in. So um, thanks, everybody. Um, just in the interest of time, um, and not wanting to keep people too much longer, uh, my dog has clearly decided it's lunchtime as well because she wants to leave the room. Um, you can't yet. Um, so I think we'll just sort of bring back to, um, to Harriet, Kate and myself now to just close on some, some brief reflections, I guess, around the policy relevance of, of some of the things that we've talked about today. Um, I've really enjoyed this morning, really enjoyed yesterday morning. I'm quite sad that there are bits of the rest of the week that I won't be able to make because I would quite like to just sort of delve into... Um, each morning, uh, three hours of doing this uh, and, and catching up with what everyone's working on in the different hubs. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for for the input today and yesterday and, and for the rest of the week. Um, I'm sure it will will be just as stimulating throughout. And um, yeah, really cool to cover the other topics. I am um, I uh, sort of hands up. I'm not an expert and don't have any expertise in building or developing composite indicators. And those who've worked with me on, on various other things know that. I may be run in fear from some of the heavier data sets and the, and the data analysis around all of this. And it takes me an extra conversation on the side to sort of understand what's going on. So I've really, um, really feel like I've not only sort of uh, been able to weigh in on some of the stuff that, that I've been working on, but really learned a lot from everybody today. So it's been really nice to do that. And I feel like I haven't done that for quite a while. So thanks to you all specifically for that. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes sort of reflecting and it's it's come up throughout in various bits of conversation. So Kate sort of talked about the value of having in-depth qualitative work included in some of these metrics. Pedro mentioned about this sort of the limitation and implications of having binary understandings versus vulnerability indicators and how they might sit on a scale. And I kind of uh, followed that up with understanding fluidity and flexibility in this context. Um, Lynn, obviously, uh, uh, in the presentation, made a point that no two experiences are the same, and this is kind of where, where my work is situated now, working within a, within a policy directorate within the fuel poverty charity in the UK, and trying to make the case for lived experience and how we better integrate and better understand the value and the role of lived experience in the work that we're doing. In the UK context, it's patchy. Um, Scotland are ahead of us on this. Um, they have sort of uh, tested around sort of qualitative lived experience panels. And they've commissioned research that has specifically looked at the value of lived experience and what we know and where the gaps are. Um, academics are, are leading on this actually. Um, uh, so the, the, the overwhelming bulk of the work um, around lived experience work within the context of energy poverty, particularly in the UK, um, is, is done in an academic setting. So then really the challenge for a lot of us is how do we communicate that to policy and, and make that relevance really clear. And how can that be integrated within some of this brilliant work that's being done around composite indicators at, at different regional, national, geographical scales? Um, so I'm just kind of going to draw on a, two or three things quickly, and I'll try and I'll try and whisk through them so that Kate and Harry have got some time to talk. Um, so uh, a really brilliant paper by some academics called Macintosh and Wright starts to pull apart um, uh, the understanding of lived experience is sort of a free floating notion. So we do risk this sort of zeitgeisty moment where lived experience is quite a trendy thing to, to look at and to pull out and draw out. 
Um, but in that sort of as critical scientists, as critical social scientists for most of us, um, sort of understanding what that concept means in different disciplinary and uh, topic bounds is really important. And, and again, stilling that and spending some time pulling that apart is really important for if we're going to make the case clearly and um, really highlight and foreground that relevance to, to other audiences, including policymakers. Um, so that this kind of moving beyond this idea of a free floating notion, uh, much of the work around lived experience is kind of situated in ethnographic work, feminist study, um, or the area where I would situate myself, which is in phenomenological psychology. So understanding what it means to experience some of these things. And also, um, which leads into the question I was going to ask of the presenters, what does this mean for other people's experiences, not just householders? So those on the front line, those working in local authorities, those uh, delivering a, a wide array of services, relatives, friends, neighbours. Um, there are many, many actors that we don't yet understand their role and, and, and their input and output within, within the context of energy vulnerability. And that kind of links in quite nicely with some of the conversations um, around social relations and the values that we can see there. And we know that um, Lucy and, and Tom did some brilliant work around typologies of relations um, and, and what they mean in the context of energy poverty in terms of shaping or constraining the, the efforts of policies. And one particular framing that I really like is from Van Manen in, in Phenomenology, where he sets out these five existentials or these ways of understanding lived um, worlds. Um, and, and I'd be happy to share that work afterwards. But um, kind of breaking this down in a way that metrics might not to understand things like lived relation so focus on relationality lived body and how we experience things in our body so corporality lived space and time and i know time and place has come up time and time again and lived things and technology so linking back to some of the conversations we had yesterday around digitization um, and understanding what um, phenomenologically how we, we experience technology and, and where the constraints are within that so really all of this is kind of tying into that critical engagement within social policy and other disciplines with the term lived experience and, and making the case for its value within wider conversations. And um, there is this predilection, the epistemological predilection as Macintosh and Wright refer to it, um, that we foreground experiential ways of knowing, yet we're not very good at, at so, sort of doing the next step of, of what that means. So we're really good at telling stories and we're really good at being impactful with our stories, but then what do those stories do? How can we make them work to make better policy and, and ultimately better practice? Um, Lucy's work in, in one of the past Engager conferences or uh, one of the outputs from a couple of years ago, which Harriet and Sid um, co-edited, Kind of does this as a really nice example around switching and that we kind of understand switching in a technical rational model that if we took all these human beings who are uh, sort of empty pots or part full vessels that need filling up with information if we just filled them up with information that they would go on and make better decisions as energy consumers and we all know whether we're qualitative researchers or not that that simply isn't the case with householders and that actually the experiences set out there are much more relational so with people's relationships with their providers people's relationships with their landlords people's relationships with with those they shared houses with or those that they share houses with at, at the present time um, and kind of drawing nicely on some of the wider things so people's experiences around health and employment are really important here because those relate relationships count as well in terms of how we make decisions day to day in our lives and which decisions come first, second, third, fourth, fifth um, when we're facing particularly tricky times in life. Um, and the last sort of thing I'm going to pull on that is um, kind of leading on from Lucy's work in some of my own um, uh, uh, work more recently, the analysis around understanding prepayment meters and we talked a bit about debt and switching but also around the sort of psychology and the experiential aspects of, of having a prepayment meter in the UK context particularly. We have this fascination with getting people away from prepayment meters and, and uh, we need to get them off prepayment meters. It's uh, more expensive, very difficult, tricky the wrong way to pay for your energy and it's one that's exclusively opted in by the only uh, by those who are low income or particularly vulnerable and um, actually there's a lot more psychological domains to this and, and, and again thinking more relationally um prepayment meter allows a payment mechanism where there's very little contact with an energy supplier so pulling on these notions of trust and difficulties around communication and contact actually the prepayment meter isn't just about budgeting or control it also provides a mechanism where you don't have to really engage with your energy supplier at all and so these are just some of the key examples sort of uh, in thinking around the work that i've been engaged in or, or those around me that have, have, have been particularly interesting um, and I'd be happy to pick up these conversations further. I don't have any answers to how you integrate this work more meaningfully or neatly um, into it. Um, but there is a there is a gap in taking it from what we know as academics 
and, and making that clear case in policy. Um, yeah, super. So I'll, I think I'll stop there and um, hand over to Harriet first. Uh, Kate, I think. Kate first, sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry. Thanks, Danielle. That was super interesting and um, really interesting to hear all the kind of linking it together with the qualitative perspective. Um, so I guess I'm kind of coming at it from more of a quantitative human geography perspective. Um, and one of my key interests when thinking about composite indicators of energy poverty is trying to reflect the geographies of different types of energy vulnerability in our measurement techniques, as um, I sort of alluded to earlier. So especially thinking about spatial and increasingly temporal dimensions. And um, so the kind of two points I suppose I wanted to close on, um, hopefully briefly, so I think um, one of the key things we need to think about going forward is how different energy vulnerability factors are likely to matter, more or less depending on the characteristics of a place or a community. So I, I think we've talked about that a fair bit in terms of the national context during today's um, discussions, but thinking more specifically about, um, you know, kind of really localised um, approaches. So our approach to the design of the composite indicators today um, was assuming that one that each factor mattered proportionally and um, the same for all people and places within our data set. So for example, we were assigning a weight of 10% to one particular indicator. And in reality, we know that this isn't the case, that that doesn't matter the same um, in every single area. So for some places, for example, the energy efficiency of the housing stock is likely to matter more um, in defining energy poverty, whereas elsewhere it might be something like um, low incomes. And I think it's important to start thinking about how we can start to reflect this variability in the design of our indicators. Um, otherwise, our approach to measurement is going to um, favour particular issues or social groups or places. Um, and then I guess the other general point I wanted to make was that we don't often talk about, well, we, we tend to talk less about the temporal variations in composite indicators, which I think is partly um, what Harriet was identifying often an issue again with just the data collection. Um, but as a result, our measurement approaches tend to be quite temporally static. So we know from understandings of the lived experience of energy poverty that people move in and out of energy poverty, um, whether that be seasonally or whether it be in response to a particular crisis in that person's life or during the life course. Um, and I think, again, that's something that it would, be, it would be fantastic to be able to better reflect within our measurement approaches. So those are two quite complex ideas and I'm not saying they're easy, easy things to um, tackle, but it's sort of something to think about. And then I guess the key question then is how do you then start to translate this into policy where um, perhaps you know, your messages need to be a lot more um, clear and concise um, and yeah, how do you embed these these ideas within that. So yeah, that's it for me and I shall pass over to Harriet, last but not least. Perfect, thank you very much. Hard act to follow you too. <laughs> um, so just in the last few minutes, I would like to reflect on just two concepts. So the first one is around incompleteness. Um, so really drawing on, on what both Kate and Danielle have said and the presentation we heard from, um, from the Birmingham group. Um, and there's one kind of theorist in particular, Portuguese theorist, um, so Boaventura um, de Salsa de Santos, and he writes about um, the kind of the plural ways of knowing um, and kind of the, the idea of incompleteness among cultures um, and how we kind of learn from each other. And I think it's a really nice concept that I like to apply when I, I kind of teach and think about doing interdisciplinary research, think about the incompleteness of different disciplines and what they're kind of bringing to the, to the pot. Um, but I think that idea of incompleteness in, in indicators is quite a, a useful way of viewing it. So we, we know that they're always flawed. Um, the underlying data is, is not ideal. Um, as we've seen today in that breakout room exercise, there's always more that we would want to do. Um, so I think if we kind of view everything as a work in progress that's incomplete, um, a kind of continuing story. And I think uh, Joao was touching on, on this idea of uh, indices as, as kind of a living, um, evolving concept. Um, and, you know, certainly there's some lessons we can draw from the UK's experience where we had a very sticky 10% metric. And um, certainly there's a lot of flaws uh, and problems that that kind of created 
over time. So how can we make sure that we build in mechanisms for, uh, for both recognizing that incompleteness, but also trying to update it to reflect a wider society? Um, and the second one is about complexity. So the, the questions I like to, to try and unpick in my work is how can we embed more complexity within um, particularly statistical indicators? Um, again, that issue of, of data flattening. Um, uh, some of you might have been at a workshop a couple of weeks ago where we looked at the capabilities approach. Um, so I think there's a lot that kind of human centered frameworks outside of energy poverty can offer to us for kind of forcing us in a way to uh, to consider wider dimensions of, of people's everyday lives. Um, and yeah, the moment sort of in the last couple of years been having, well, before kind of COVID came along, uh, was, you know, been having a lot of fun trying to experiment with integrating participatory qualitative forms of data within um, uh, indexes that are built from existing national surveys. So certainly um, more, more questions and answers have come from that. Um, but I hope we can all keep these conversations going. There's been so many interesting discussions come up. Um, the, the presentation slides I'll, I'll certainly be going back to and <laughs> revisiting. There's just a, a lot of really interesting thoughts in there. Um, so yeah, definitely keep up the conversation. Um, the Engager Network still has, you know, I think more than a year to run. Um, so there's any kind of activity that would be useful for helping people to connect up to collaborate on something, then um, definitely let one of the kind of working group leaders know um, and we can definitely get that set up. But otherwise, just to say thank you so much for your attention. I know it's quite hard to, to take three hours out of your day, especially in these times, uh, but it's definitely been quite a privilege to, to, to have this space for, for thinking through all of these issues with you. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks everybody. Oh, sorry, logistics, my last thing, my last job. <laughs> um, so I um, will send you off to your breakout rooms if you haven't gone now um, to discuss your group work, but feel very free if, you're, if you've got your 500 word essay under control and, and, and you wanna kind of just touch base with your, your groups and, and disappear, that's absolutely fine. Harriet, Kate and I will, will linger in here for, for a few more minutes, um, at least until midday, um, in case anybody wants to drop back in and has any questions. Um, but if nobody's raising arms, eyebrows in alarm, I will send you off to breakout rooms now. So one final thanks for us and we'll see you all in the morning. And we should just get left with trainers.